We're now going to uh, read from Paul's letter to the Colossians, after which John is going to come and um, bring God's word to us. So it's Colossians chapter 1, the first eight verses. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints. The faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for John, and you, we pray now that um, as he comes and brings your word to us, you will enable him to um, preach to us in power and let us know exactly what it is you want us to learn through you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thank you, Ian. That's great. Uh, because it's harvest, it gives me a chance to um, tell my one and only farmer joke. I know, and uh, the, I, I measure the effectiveness of the jokes I tell by the groans, not the laughs at the end of them, so I shall be hoping to hear something of response to this joke. The man drives uh, to work uh, every day on his commute, passes uh, a farmer, the fields and so on, and on Monday morning he sees the farmer standing in the middle of his field, doesn't think much of it. Uh, on the way back, the farmer's still there standing in the middle of his field. Tuesday, there's the farmer standing in the middle of his field in the morning. Tuesday evening, the man's coming back on his commute. The farmer's still there. It goes on all week. And at the end of the week, the man who's done the commute thinks, I need to ask this farmer what he's doing. He's just been standing out in his field, it looks like, all day, uh, every day of the week. And so, Friday evening, he goes over, talks to the farmer. I was actually, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking to win a Nobel Prize. And the guy looks at him kind of puzzled. And the farmer says, well, actually... I, I've heard that they give Nobel Prizes to those who are outstanding in their field. That's a good joke then, that's lots of groans, okay, that's good. But actually, I don't want to speak to you about the harvest of the field today, I want to speak to you about the harvest of the gospel. And uh, Ian, in his reading earlier, kind of uh, told us about Paul's words there in Colossians 1, verses 1 to 6, and uh, it's about the harvest of the gospel. And there, particularly uh, in uh, that verse, all over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. And there's reference there to the fruit of the gospel. Now, I need just to say that the gospel is the message about Jesus. And it's the message about Jesus that God speaks. The gospel is God's word about Jesus. It isn't what we say about Jesus. The gospel is what God says about Jesus. And in that way, the gospel represents the word that God speaks to this world. And in this text in Colossians, what we're learning is that the word God speaks about Jesus bears fruit and has an impact in this world. And the whole of the Bible is about Jesus. Uh, there in uh, John 5, verse 39, Jesus speaking to those who read the Bible in his day, say, you search the Scriptures, but you don't realize that the Scriptures, that the whole of the Old Testament, says Jesus, bear witness to me. And the Old Testament 
was pointing to Jesus. The New Testament is teaching about him. The whole Bible is God's word about Jesus. The gospel, God's word about Jesus. And so when we read here that the gospel is bearing fruit, we're learning that the word God speaks to the world, the word God speaks about Jesus, bears fruit in this world. And this idea of bearing fruit is that the gospel changes things. These are some words that the prophet Isaiah, way back in the Old Testament, spoke. God speaking through Isaiah. Uh, uh, Says that as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return to it, without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth, says God. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. The gospel has a power. The word God speaks about Jesus has a power to make a change in this world. And I want to speak to you about the difference that the word God speaks to you can make in your life today. Because Paul does speak here specifically about the fruit that the gospel brings. He, uh, he says here about the Colossians earlier on in verses 4 and 5, we have heard about your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven that you have already heard about in the word of truth the gospel. And Paul speaks there of faith, love, and hope as three of the fruit that the word God speaks about Jesus has created in the lives of the Colossians. When Paul speaks about faith, he means faith in Jesus, trusting his promise for you, confident in his love for you, looking for his guidance for your life. You trust him to forgive you your sins and guide your ways and lead you safe to heaven. That's the kind of faith that the good news of Jesus, the word God speaks, creates in the lives of people. It creates love. Paul speaks here of love for all the saints. He's not discounting the love that Christians are to have for the whole world. But Paul is specifically thinking of how the gospel, the good news, the word God speaks about Jesus, creates in the hearts of those who believe it a love for others. And when that love for others is reciprocated by other Christians, then the church becomes a family, a community of love. And the gospel, the word God speaks, changes the hearts of those who believe it so that they love others as God loves them. And the gospel produces hope. The word hope here speaks of the hope of heaven. The hope of heaven is the assurance, the certainty, the confidence you have that there is a place in heaven for you. And the word God speaks about Jesus creates in the hearts of those who believe it a certainty that heaven is their home that there is a place for them in the presence of their Father for all eternity. And and that certainty of heaven sets you free to live life in this world in all its fullness. Let me say this to you. You will never find what life in this world is about until you are certain of life in the world to come. And the hope of the gospel The certainty of eternal life sets you free to live life in this world as God wants it. And the gospel, the message of Jesus that God speaks, creates faith, love, and hope in the lives of those who hear it. And so look, very simply, I'd say to you this this morning. If you already have enough faith enough love, enough hope, you don't need to read the Bible. 
You've already got what reading the Bible will do for you. The Bible is God's word about Jesus. Paul says that God's word about Jesus, when it's heard, will create faith and love and hope in the hearts of those who receive it. So look, guys, if you've got enough already, faith, hope and love, you don't need to read the Bible. It's fine. Off you go. You don't, you don't need to look at it ever again. But if you would have more faith than you already have, if you would have a greater love than you've already got, if you would have a deeper assurance of your place in heaven, then all you need to read the Bible, God's word about Jesus. Because the word God speaks about Jesus creates faith, hope, and love in the lives of those who receive it. And so I want to encourage you to consider reading the Bible more for yourself, that the fruit the gospel bears, faith, hope, and love, may strengthen in your lives. I want to say something secondly here about the field in which the, the gospel is sown. Paul says here to the Colossians, all over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. Paul mentions the whole world. He doesn't mean there every kind of uh, tribe and language and people groups around the world. In Paul's day, the Roman Empire was the dominant power. And, and really people thought that the Roman Empire reached the whole world. And there it is in green. You'll see it all around the Mediterranean, the Romans had established their empire. Even up to uh, England there in the, the north. And the phrase the whole world means the whole Roman Empire, because that's what people thought of the empire, it was the whole world. And what Paul is saying is that the whole known world has been impacted by the gospel. And he's making a claim there that there are no barriers or obstacles that God's word about Jesus can't cross. There are no places God's word about Jesus can't reach. There is no power that can resist God's word about Jesus. There are no ideas that can negate it. The whole world is open to the gospel, the word God speaks about Jesus. And one of the tremendously encouraging things about that for you and for me is that there can be nothing in our circumstances that can negate the power of the gospel to grow faith, love, and hope in your heart. There can be no problem in your life that cancels out the power of the gospel to change you from within. There can be nothing in your circumstance, nothing in your nature, nothing in your upbringing, nothing in your education, nothing in your circumstances or in your job or in your family. Nothing can hinder the gospel bearing fruit because it's bearing fruit all over the world. And if it can do that all over the world, why can it not do it in your heart? There's no reason. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good job I brought this water. There is no reason why God's word about Jesus can't bear that kind of fruit. It's all over the world. But it's also that the gospel is sown in the individual heart. So Paul can say of the Colossians that the gospel is bearing fruit all over the world as it is bearing fruit in your heart. And, and what I want to say about that is that although the word God speaks about Jesus is addressed to the whole world, God always, always has a focus on the individual when he speaks. You don't hear God doing what I'm doing now, shouting. You hear God speaking to your own heart calling you by name, individually, personally, directly, to you. That's how it is. 
And there'll be times when you'll be reading the Bible and God will touch your heart and it's his word for you. There'll be times when you're listening to a sermon and God, and God will touch your heart and it's his word to you. And, and I want to say that the word of God, the word God speaks about Jesus, is not something that you should think of as kind of being broadcast to the masses. You should think of it as being spoken directly to you by name. Because that's how it is. God has a word for you. The right word. Wise, true and powerful. He has a word for you. And it will change your life. It will bear fruit of faith love and hope as you hear it and although the gospel the, the the field of the gospel is the whole world it is always spoken to individuals hearts one by one and then finally i just want to say something to you about the way that the gospel was spread because paul speaks here of epaphras he says you learned the gospel from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who told us of your love in the Spirit. Epaphras was the human being through whom God first spoke about Jesus in the city of Colossae. And it was from Epaphras that the Colossians learned of Jesus and the word God spoke about Jesus through Epaphras brought faith, love, and hope to birth in the heart of the Colossians. And the, the gospel was sown by this man whom we know here as Epaphras. And I want to point these things out to you about Epaphras. He was part of a team, significant that Paul describes him here as our dear fellow servant. So although Epaphras went without Paul to Colossae, and it seems he was on his own when he was first preaching there, nonetheless, Epaphras was a team player. He was someone who was part of a group who together made Jesus known in their generation. And the reason I point this out this morning is because when you and I are called to make Jesus known in this world, and we are called to do that. When we are called to do that, we are never called to do it as lone rangers. We are never expected by God to stand alone in this world and make Jesus known. We are always set in a team to make God known. And what I want to say to you this morning is don't despair of your ability to play a part in this team. You see, you may think this morning, how many people have I led to faith in Christ? Hmm. Not one. How, how many people have I prayed with and they've been healed? Hmm. Can't think of many. How many, how many lives have I seen changed by the impact of my life and my words? Not many. And, and you may kind of think, you know, good on Epaphras, but that's not me. Well, actually, if you think like that, how many people have I led to faith in Christ? How many people have I prayed for and miracles of healing has come? You're not thinking in quite the right way. The way you ought to think is this. How many people has the team of which I am part led people to faith in Christ? How many? See, the team you're in, Bushy Baptist Church, have people come to faith in Christ in these recent years? Yes. You're part of the team that made that happen. Have there been prayers and God's granted healing here in the context of this church as we prayed? Yes. And you're part of the team that made that happen. Have lives been changed? Yes. And you're part of the team 
that made that happen. Epaphras, my dear fellow worker, it's part of a team as a body that we bear our fruit for God in the work of the gospel. And I want you to be encouraged by that this morning. But I also want to say this to you. Make sure that you are pulling your weight in the team. See, the whole thing about a team is that everyone in it has to do their bit. And there might well be stars and giants in the team, like in some football teams, who can apparently do amazing stuff. But the reality is, it's a team game. And what happens when one member of the team doesn't pull their weight is that the others have to try and pick it up. And the more of other people's weight you have to pick up in the team, the more discouraging it can be for you until you start struggling and setting the weight down instead. But look, if making Christ known is a team work, then make sure you're playing your part in the team. Epaphras was a team player. Oh. And uh, the, the other thing about Epaphras is that Paul speaks of him as a faithful minister of Christ. And there are just two final things I want to say about this on Epaphras. Epaphras was the man through whom God spoke the gospel to Glossy. And through Epaphras, the gospel bore faith, hope, and love, those fruits in the hearts of the Colossians. Epaphras was a team player, but he was also a faithful minister of Christ. And that phrase, faithful, faithful minister of Christ, has two ideas within it. It means he was faithful to the work Jesus had given him to do. A faithful minister of Christ. It meant that he stuck at the work when it was difficult. And if you and I are to bear fruit in our service of God and see the gospel changing lives, then as team players we need to be faithful to the role that God has given us. That means sticking at it when it's tough. And that was Epaphras. But it doesn't only be, mean being faithful to the work. It means this phrase, faithful servant of Christ, it means being faithful to Jesus. It means being faithful in Epaphras' relationship with Christ. It means he was not only faithful to the work, he was faithful to Jesus too. And that meant he kept his focus and allegiance and loyalty on Jesus. And I want to end this sermon by then saying this to you today. If you would play your part, in the work that God is doing of, of growing faith, hope and love in the hearts of people through the gospel, if you would do that, then the thing more important than anything else that is vital for you is that you remain faithful to Jesus. You remain faithful to him. He is to be your first love. He is to be your Lord and your King. You are to bow your knee to him and yield to his will and his purpose for you. And right now, can I ask you, in your heart, just now, this very moment, say to Jesus, my Lord and my God, you know those words of Thomas and the resurrection? My Lord and my God, affirm your loyalty to him. And may God bless us as we seek to serve him in these days.